Let's bow our heads before we open God's word this morning. Kind Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your mercy and your kindness for giving us another day, another opportunity to come and sit at your feet. And that's what we want to do today, Heavenly Father. Help us to sit at your feet. Help us to hear and understand and help us to be changed because of your presence through the wonderful power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you now for these things in Christ's name, amen. I can't believe it. There are so many interesting stories out there, you know, and in Christ's ministry, he always, you know, was sharing a story or a, 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 an illustration of some kind to help bring home the message of God's wonderful love or some important truth that, that that we need so desperately to understand. And so I've included a couple of stories here in our uh, message for today that illustrate some of the main points that we'll see in the Bible lesson itself. Well, you have the picture there of a young man who was involved in the war on terrorism in Iraq. The Congressional Medal of Honor was given to this man for conspicuous, conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of life above and beyond the call of duty. You know, I just have to stop there for a minute and think, isn't that what God did? Above and beyond the call of duty. You know, no one forced, no one said he had to come here, but he did, above and beyond the call of duty. As automatic weapon, weapons gunner for the Naval Special Warfare Task Group in, Arab in the Arabian Peninsula in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom on September 29, 2006 is the story that we have for us here today. As a member of the Combined SEAL and Iraqi Army Sniper Overwatch, we're located on a rooftop in an insurgent held area of our Ramadi in Iraq, Petty Officer Mansour distinguished himself by exceptional bravery in the face of grave danger. In the early morning, insurgents prepared to execute and coordinate attack. Navy, SEAL, and Iraqi Army snipers thwarted the enemy's initial attempts. The enemy continued to assault, engaging them in with a rocket-propelled grenade and small arms fire. As, in, as the enemy advanced activity increased, Petty Officer Mansour took position with his gun between his two teammates on an over outcropping of the roof. While the SEALs vigilantly watched for enemy activity, an insurgent threw a hand grenade from an unseen location which bounced off Petty Officer's chest and landed right in front of him. <clears throat> Although only he could have escaped the blast, Petty Officer Monsor chose instead to protect his teammates. Instead, without regard to his own safety, he threw himself onto the grenade and absorbed the force of that explosion with his own body saving the lives of his two teammates. By his undaunted courage, fighting spirit, and unwavering devotion to duty in the face of certain death, Petty Officer Monsor gallantly gave his life for his country, thereby reflecting great credit upon himself and upholding the highest traditions of the United States Navy service. I know I, don't, I didn't want to share that as some kind of a downer, but you know what I mean? Uh, what did Jesus say just the night before going to the cross? Greater love. See, that's what it's all about. Greater love has no one than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, Jesus said, if you do whatever I command you to do. So while we can lay down our lives for our friends, and God says that that's a noble thing to do, a, a thing of love to do. What about the one who lays down his life for the entire human race? 
how much greater is the love that he would do that even for those that would never accept the sacrifice that he was offering. He still laid down his life for the entire human race. Greater love cannot be dis, uh, demonstrated, you know, in our lives or in the life of God, in the life of Christ, than willingness to literally lay down your life that somebody else might have, have life instead. Well, <clears throat> Our story, our key text, uh, the story you know, that we have today, um, the story that we're going to look at comes from Matthew chapter 20, and it is the story of two boys, young men, who were disciples of Christ, who decided they wanted the top post in Christ's kingdom. I'd like to, sh I put the text here because there's many translations that we might have this morning, but we can at least all look and see the same text as we uh, think about the story. <clears throat> Matthew 20, verses 20 to 28, the entire story is right there. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him, that's came to Jesus, with her sons kneeling down and asking something from him. He said to her, what do you wish? Don't you think Christ already knew? She said to him, Grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and the other on your left, in your kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, You do not know what you're asking for. Are you able to drink the cup that I am able to drink, that about, am about to drink, and to be baptized with the baptism that I will be baptized with? They had no idea what was about to happen. They didn't understand. It wasn't until after the cross that they started to see things and that what Christ had said was going to happen to him when he came to Jerusalem. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm able to drink? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism that I'm going to be baptized with? They had no idea what was about to happen, even though Christ had already told them three times he would go to Jerusalem, he would be killed, he would rise the third day. They said unto him, we are able. Can you see? They were standing in their own strength when they said that that day. You will indeed drink of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared by my Father. And when the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased and with, with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who, have great, who um, are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be among you. But whosoever desires to be great among you, let him be your servant." And whosoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And so right there, you see again Christ mentioning what he was going to be going through. So I'd like to take a few minutes and we'll just kind of briefly look at some of the high points in this story. In Matthew 20, beginning with verse 20, is the request, grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and the other on your left in your kingdom. Well, there's two reactions to, to this, and of course we read the disciples' reaction. And when the ten heard of it, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. Why? It's because they wanted that for themselves and somebody beat them to making the request. Just in the previous chapter in, in Mark, chapter nine, just maybe if a few days before, uh, the, the Bible tells us, then Jesus came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what was it that you disputed among yourselves on the road? He knew 
there was a problem. They were disputing among themselves. But they kept silent, for on the road they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. Who was going to be the greatest? Can you see the earthly thinking? Who's going to be the greatest? I want to be on top. I want to be in charge. I want everybody to be under me. I want them to do what, you know, the way that I understand things is the way that there is the best way, you know what I mean, and nobody's going to be able to correct me because I'm going to be on top, you know what I mean? And that's just an echo of where Lucifer was in heaven. You know, we, we get in, we're still infected with that sometimes, you know. Uh, we want, I want my way, you know, what I mean? my way is the best way, you know what I mean. And, um, but that's where they were, you know what I mean, and it's just an echo of the very first problem that existed in heaven with a very high, mighty angel coveting the top position of God himself. Well, then we come to Christ's reaction to that request, and I really like this part. And uh, I have several quotations here. I hope there are, there's not too many quotations for you, but it's uh, talked about very beautifully in the book, Desire of Ages. The background on James and John, just before we get to Christ's response to them. Well, who are these guys, huh? Well, we read that John and James, James and John, Andrew and Peter, Philip and Nathaniel and Matthew had been more closely connected with him, this Jesus, than had the others, and had witnessed more of his miracles. So there's some that were with Christ more than the other disciples. Maybe some of the other disciples took R and R's now and then and went back to see their families, but here's a group that just said, we're, we're hanging with Jesus. We, we want to see more. Peter, James, and John stood in still nearer relationship to him. They were almost constantly with him, witnessing his miracles and hearing his words. John pressed still closer in intimacy with Jesus so that he is distinguished in the Bible as the one that Jesus loved. The Savior loved them all, but John was the most, had the most receptive spirit. He was younger than the others, and with more of a child's confiding trust, he opened his heart to Jesus. Thus, he came more and more into sympathy with Christ, and through him, the Savior's deepest spiritual teachings were communicated to his people. So who are these boys that are coming and kneeling down in front of Jesus? They're the ones that have been the closest to Jesus. You know, they're not the ones that you know, they, they were the ones that spent the most time with Jesus. They were the ones that were, their lives were being transformed more fully into his likeness. <clears throat> That's the ones. So here's the first main point from this story, at least that I saw. How did Jesus treat their request? I love this quotation. Jesus bears tenderly with them, not rebuking their selfishness and seeking, and seeking preference over their brethren. He reads the heart. He knows the depth of their attachment to him. Their love is not a mere human affection, though defiled by earthliness of the human channel. It is an outflow from the fountain of his own redeeming love. He will not rebuke, but he will deepen and purify that love. Can you say amen? This is how Jesus treats people. You know what I mean? He looks into the heart. He sees what's going on. He sees the, yeah, it's, it doesn't look so good on the surface, but I know what's going on in their heart. You know what I mean? Thank God. He looks at the heart, and then he wants to, he sees it on that level rather than on the surface level of a selfish grab for power. He doesn't see it on that level at all. But instead, he's, he's going to deepen that love and purify that love. And then the second point comes right after that. <clears throat> what is closeness to Christ really based on? That's what they were asking, right? They were asking to sit on the right hand 
and to sit on the left hand of Jesus. So what does Jesus say that closeness to him is really based upon? And uh, maybe just pause here for a second because maybe we might not see ourselves in this story unless we do. I, I would never ask to be on the right hand of Christ or on the left hand of Christ. Would I? Well, I think if I would have been one of the disciples, I probably would have been there, you know. And maybe if I was like James and John, two of the three, Peter, James, and John, that were actually spent, that were actually the closest to Christ of all of the 12, maybe that closeness to Christ, you know what I mean, and uh, yielding their lives and their character to Christ, maybe that would prompt me to want to be closer to Christ, you know what I mean, in some way. I, I, I hope that each one of us would want some closeness to Christ, the, uh, the, deeper, the deeper closeness to Christ that we could have, not for any selfish purpose, but for the purpose of getting to know him better and to becoming more like him. And so what is closeness based upon in God's kingdom? Well, I'm gonna quote from Desire of Ages again here. In the kingdom of God, position is not gained through favoritism. It's not because you're my brother or you're my sister or you're my favorite that you get position in God's kingdom. It is not earned, nor is it received through any arbitrary bestowal. It is the result of what? I got it in red. Character, you know. Closeness to Christ is based upon character. The crowd, the, the crown, and the throne are tokens of a condition attained. They are tokens of what? Self-conquest. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, long afterward, when the disciple, that's John, had been brought into sympathy with Christ through fellowship of his sufferings, the Lord revealed to John what is the condition of nearness in his kingdom. What is it? We read it in Revelation chapter 3. To him that overcometh, Christ said, I will grant to sit with me on the right hand and on the left, to sit with me on my throne, even as I also overcame and sat down with my Father in his throne. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more, and I will write upon him my name, and I will write upon him my new name. What is the condition of closeness to Christ? It's character. The crown and the throne are tokens of a condition that is attained by the grace of God. They are tokens by the grace of God of self-conquest through our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who stands the nearest to Christ will be the one on earth who has drunk most deeply of the spirit of his self-sacrificing love. Love that vaunteth not his own, is not puffed up, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinks no evil. Love that moves the disciple as it moved our Lord to give all, to live and to labor and to sacrifice even unto death for the saving of humanity. Can you see the conditions of being near Christ through eternity? You know what I mean? It will be given to those who are, who are living like Christ, moved by the Holy Spirit to give their life, to have the character to be overcomer, to have the character of God, to labor and sacrifice even unto death for the saving of humanity. The spirit was made, this spirit was made manifest in the life of Paul where he said, for me to live is Christ. There's no difference. For his life revealed Christ to men and to die is gain, gain to Christ. Death itself would make manifest the power of his grace and gather souls into his kingdom. Christ shall be magnified in my body, he said, whether 
it is by life or by death. And then Christ's own, Christ's own life illustrates that himself. And I don't know whether you would, you know, this passage from Philippians chapter 2, it's a familiar passage, but had you ever thought about it before in connection with the request of the disciples and Christ's answer himself? Because we see a parallel, the parallel ideas right here in the life of Christ that he was talking to his disciples about that day, they who had asked for the highest positions in his kingdom. Is illustrated, the right answer and the right way is illustrated in the very life of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but what did he do? He made himself of no reputation taking the form of a bondservant, a slave, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he didn't stop there. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross, for the saving of humanity. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth, and that at every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. <clears throat> Can you see how that was illustrated? The very thing that he was teaching the disciples that day, that nearness to him is based upon character, self-conquest, overcoming, and self-sacrificial service. Christ was establishing a kingdom on different principles. He called men not to authority, but to service. The strong bear the infirmities of the weak. Power, position, talent, education, place its possessor under what? Greater obligations to serve his fellow men. And then finally, <clears throat> the precious graces of the Holy Spirit. I want to thank God that, that I found this quotation in um, what's called the Revival and Reformation Devotions. I don't know if, if you've heard of them, Revival and Reformation. The General Conference sends out, uh, has a Ellen White um, devotional book that... Uh, is in electronic format, and every day you can get the devotional reading for that day uh, to your phone or whatever your computer might be. And this one I found just a couple days ago. The precious graces of the Holy Spirit are not developed in a moment. Courage, fortitude, meekness, faith, unwavering trust in God's power to save are acquired by the experience of years, by a life of holy endeavor and firm adherence to the right. The children of God are to seal their destiny. We have no time to lose. We know not how soon our probation may close. Eternity stretches before us. Is it stretched out before you? I hope so. The curtain is about to be lifted. Christ is soon to come. The angels of God are seeking to attract us from ourselves and from the earthly things. Let them not labor in vain. Well, uh, two weeks ago when we looked at our Bible lesson, uh, it concluded with this passage. And I've, I've put it here again because it is the supreme example of Christ himself demonstrating in his own life the very things that he was trying to teach those two boys, James and John, when they came and asked for the highest positions in his kingdom. Here again we see in the very, in the very example a life of Christ the right way to look at that. Luke 23, 33 and 47. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the male factors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus, 
Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they parted his raiment, and he cast lots. And the people stood by beholding. And the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he be the Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, come, come, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil in the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he gave up the ghost. Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God by saying what? Certainly, that was a righteous man. And so in the life of Christ himself, most greatly demonstrated when he was on the cross, he demonstrated character. It's character, his love, his love for the lost. Jesus literally, in service to humanity, says, Father, I'm returning my breath to you, and then he breathes out. I mean, what else can somebody do? You know what I mean. In love and in service and in character. Nearness to Christ is based upon character developed by the grace of God as we spend time with him day by day. It doesn't happen in a moment. It takes time. Thank God he's given us time, right? He's given us time. Another day, another week, another year right, to grow and become in his likeness. Well, how do we get the character and how do we, we get the things, the loving service that is so demonstrated in the life of Christ? Well, I hope this is one of your key texts and favorite Bible verses, 2 Corinthians 3.18. It says it's so simple that a child could understand it. I hope we are able to understand it as well. But we all with unveiled faces beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. What are we doing? We're beholding the glory of the Lord. Are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory as by the Spirit of the Lord. And what does that mean? How do, how do we behold the glory of the Lord? We're gonna see it right there. We're gonna see it in God's word. We're gonna behold the glory of God as we kneel in prayer, as we share with others. We're gonna be beholding his glory. Are you doing that? You know, I pray that you will. More and more, spend more time like Peter, James and John spent that time with Jesus. They were transformed. They had a deeper relationship than anybody else because they beheld and they beheld and they beheld. And they were changed. Part of this story I shared before and part of it uh, I found more that was interesting about Albert Schweitzer. Uh, he's not an unknown name by any means. A brilliant young man, at the age of 25, he held a doctorate of philosophy degree, a doctorate of theology degree, and was a recognized European organist. And how old is he? 25. How do you do that? Well, uh, as I read part of his biography, I read that he came from a long line of preachers and a long line of musicians. That's the heritage that, that he had. At the age of 28, Albert Schweitzer was the dean of the St. Thomas's Theological College in the University of Strasbourg, and that's France, just over the German border. He tells the story of how he walked into his office one day, 
picked up the journal of the Paris Missionary Society, he was living in Paris at that time, and he read an article calling for missionary doctors to go to equatorial Africa. He put it down pensively and said to himself, but I'm not a doctor, what am I gonna do? But I mean, my, my heart is going out to this great need. Then he said to himself, think of the job and the position that he has. I'm going to continue in my present position until I'm 30, and then I'm going to resign, and then I'm going to study medicine for six years, and then I'm gonna to go to equatorial Africa and be a medical missionary. Well, very few men could have done that, but he did. At the age of 30, he resigned his position as principal or dean of St. Thomas's Theological College and entered the medical department of the same university as a freshman student. He studied medicine for six years, got married, and went to Lamborghini, Africa. There he served the poor, poor people of Africa for the next 46 years, a little bit of time in between then. He was actually a prisoner of war. When there was war, he was taken captive and put in a prisoner of war camp as well. In Lamborghini, Schweitzer was doctor and surgeon in the hospital, pastor of a congregation, administrator of a village, superintendent of the buildings and grounds, and we read that there were more than 70 buildings. This is just not a little hospital somewhere. There were 70 buildings associated with the hospital. Writer of scholarly books, commentator on contemporary history, musician, and host to countless visitors. The honors he received were numerous and included honorary doctorates from many universities emphasizing one or another of his achievements and the Nobel Prize on December 10, 1953. What did he do with that Nobel Prize money? He didn't buy a new Rolls Royce, sorry. With $33,000 prize money, he started a leposorium in Lamborghini. And you know what I see in his life? Character. And self-sacrificial loving service. 46 years, you know. He left behind the honor, you might say, the honor and the glory of being that eminent person in that university theological seminary. So I'm going to Africa. I'm going where the need is. You know what I mean? Can't, can't you see? That's what Jesus did. You know what I mean? There, things are messed up. I'm, I'm going to go. I am going to go. And I'm going to become one of them. And I'm going to help them. And um, that's, that's the heart of God right there. Can't we have that kind of heart as well? I hope so. Because in heaven, I think everybody's going to be like Jesus. To whatever, in whatever way God opens before us, we're going to be like him. We're going to give, we're going to have, develop the character by his grace through the Holy Spirit's power. And we'll, be, we'll love to serve because Jesus loved to serve. <clears throat> Character and self-sacrificial service. Well, we may have already sung our closing hymn, but let's sing it again. Thank you, Jesus, for looking at our heart, um, for letting us close to you, for keeping us near you and seal our destiny. Um, praise, praise all the glory of Jesus with Christ with a blessed and powerful message. We need our Christ character. So sorry, I'm so excited this day to see everyone, and I forgot that uh, our closing song and our opening song, I switch it. So, yeah. Can we sing, uh, Pastor, um, the Dromini or the Nearer? Nearer, still nearer. Okay. Can we sing again, Nearer, Still Nearer? Okay. Shall we all rise? Hymn number 301.
That's our prayer, Father. We want to be nearer to you. Grant our request to be near to you today and near to you throughout eternity. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.